Happy Friday, and welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for joining me here today. On this channel, we hear a story pretty often. A young man in his early 20s goes out drinking with some friends. At some point over the course of the night, they get separated, and either that young man goes missing or is sometimes found in a body of water. I thought that's the type of case I was looking at when I originally heard from Tyler Smith's mother, but as I started looking into the details, I found out there was so much more to what was going on, and I think you'll agree with me as we go through today's case. Let's get into this together and start learning about the tragedy of Tyler Smith. This takes place in Galesburg, Illinois. Galesburg is a city in Knox County, Illinois, United States. The city is 45 miles northwest of Peoria. As of the 2010 census, its, its population was over 32,000 people. Now, this isn't where Tyler was living, um, but for some reason he was visiting this area. We'll go ahead and get to that as we're getting through the articles. But let's start at this one. And uh, sometimes they will write these articles and then update them. So we're going to be looking at this one kind of upside down. But I want you to see what happens over the course of the three updates on this article over at kwqc.com. The original was posted September 16th of 2018. The Galesburg, Illinois Police Department says it plans to release more information about a body found in a ditch. Up to the next update from the following day, September 17th, the body was found in a canal on Saturday, September 15th. The man found has been identified as 23-year-old Tyler L. Smith of Concord, California. Officers responded to a report of an unresponsive person at the bottom of Cedar Fork, 75 yards east of Academy Street. Cedar Fork is a concrete canal that runs through Galesburg parallel to the BNSF railroad tracks. A pedestrian walking in the area spotted the body in Cedar Fork. Officers and emergency personnel arrived and found the person was deceased. Now, the real interesting twist in the updates on this article comes here. December 3rd, so we're talking months after the fact, police in Galesburg are asking for the public's help in finding answers. That is just a very small example of what we're seeing going on uh, with this case that's very strange. To, to be forward about it, the police seem to think this is an accidental death at first. Something nudges them to reconsider that. Uh, we're we're going to learn more as we get through the articles here. But let's continue over at WQAD.com. His dead body was found several hours after a missing persons report was filed when Smith failed to show up for National Guard training. According to the report, Smith and a friend were at a local tavern on September 14th, and Smith was last seen leaving the bar on foot at about 11.30 p.m. alone. He was later found at the bottom of Cedar Fork, just east of Academy Street, and they're once again uh, given the same description about it being a concrete canal. So let's just take a look at what they're talking about here. Uh, this is Hanson Lumber Company, and essentially... He is found kind of behind the lumber company here. Now, um, the street view only allows us to get so close from this angle, but I can zoom in on it a little bit. And you can see this canal um, pretty steep. Um, based off some information I'm seeing on the family's Facebook page for this case, looks like it's about a 17-foot drop um, if, if you did fall in from this side over here. So... This is the canal where he's found. And you can see it's running right next to the railroad tracks in this particular area. They kind of, over the course of the city, sometimes they separate a bit, but uh, here we're fairly close to it. Uh, this is a childhood scribble, right? Something that a kid would write. How many kids dream about being police officers someday? Someday I will be a policeman. I'll capture a bad guy. Someday... I will be an army man. Tyler Smith was on track to accomplish both of those goals. Let's learn more about him here at his obituary. Tyler Lewis Smith, 23, passed away Saturday, September 15th, 2018. He was born September 12th, 1995. He literally passed away just a few days after his 23rd birthday. Uh, he was born in Rochelle, and he's the son of Sandra Halsney and Keith Smith. 
Tyler was a 2014 graduate of Rochelle Township High School, where he played football all four years. He graduated in 2018 from Western Illinois University with a degree in criminal justice and a minor in Homeland Security. So once again, you can see those childhood dreams. This is something Tyler held on to, made a focus for his life, and he was heading straight for it. Tyler had recently been accepted to the San Jose, California Police Academy and had recently moved to California. So that's where we get that distance. From what I understand, um, his training in the National Guard, he was looking to get transferred to California as well. And I believe this was his last time that he was going to be training in this particular area. Currently, he was serving with the Illinois National Guard. His hobbies included being a DJ, playing and watching football, and hiking. He loved to be outdoors. The ocean and mountains are part of what brought him to California. He was an avid fan of the Chicago Bears and San Jose Sharks. Uh, seeing some pictures from his family, I think he was probably also a little bit of a Lakers fan. Tyler always had a smile on his face that lit up the room. He was regarded by friends as the glue that brought them all together. Uh, let's continue with the articles at galesburg.com. Tyler Smith loved being on a team, and once he set a goal, he pursued it with laser focus. Those were the things Sandy Halsney remembered about her son just days after he died far away from his boyhood home of Rochelle, and even farther from his brand new home at the San Jose Police Academy in California. An autopsy conducted Sunday revealed the cause of death is drowning, and the report said Smith suffered no trauma and foul play is not suspected. Now, I know you guys at this point are probably saying, John, I thought you said this wasn't like those other stories. Uh, it really isn't. He reportedly drowned in two to three inches of water. One of the things that's very tough to understand about what's going on with this case. Toxicology reports are expected in four to six weeks. Knox County Coroner Mark Thomas said he has not developed a narrative to explain why Smith was in Cedar Fork or what led to his drowning in an estimated three inches of water. Smith played football for the Rochelle High School football team where he found a social structure that he loved. Quote, Tyler loved being a teammate, his mother said. I think that's a big part of what he wanted with military and as a police officer. Members of Smith's Army National Guard unit echoed Halsney. Quote, Tyler was a hard worker. You didn't have to know him very well to see that he was serious and determined, wrote one member of the unit. He was a good soldier. He showed that with his actions, with his willingness to work. The good soldier had other goals. Not long after graduation from WIU, he applied to the San Jose Police Academy. He was one of 50 selected out of roughly 5,000 candidates. Uh, seems like he was exceptional in many, many ways. Halsney cannot fathom her grief or how her son died. None of it makes any sense, she said. Why would he be off alone and where he was? I just can't wrap my mind around any of it. It hurts. People make assumptions, but Tyler didn't do drugs. He didn't do thoughtless things. He always had his goals in mind. I'm grieving for what was taken away from my son. Sandy would take that grief and turn it into momentum. Uh, this is a woman and Tyler's father that have worked together hard for several years at this point to keep pushing on this case, conducting their own investigation, finding their own answers to the many unanswered questions. Uh, let's continue here with the articles. Sandy Halsney wants to know what happened to her son. The Rochelle resident filed a formal complaint against the Galesburg Police Department, claiming they did not thoroughly investigate the circumstances of Smith's death this past September and also alleged possible discrimination. I don't think Tyler's investigation was taken seriously from day one, she said. In less than 24 hours, it went from a homicide investigation to a drowning. There was no reason why or how he got where he was. He arrived in Galesburg on Friday, September 14th, and was planning to stay overnight with a friend before attending a National Guard drill in Macomb on Saturday. Smith reportedly went out for dinner and drinks Friday night, got separated from his friends, and never returned. An autopsy determined Smith's cause of death was drowning, but Halsney said that there are too many unanswered questions as to what exactly happened to Tyler and why. Did investigators see a mixed-race young man from California and make a decision not to investigate? Did they see interracial parents and make a conscious decision to dedicate their time to other things? Our main focus is Tyler. 
we don't feel he got a fair investigation. It's your worst nightmare with a nightmare on top of it, she added. Continuing with another article at galesburg.com, uh, which I believe is affiliated with the Register Mail, um, this is essentially a very strong kind of timeline that's been put together based off information, I think primarily from the family's investigation. But um, let's go ahead and get into the details of the events leading up to this and then some of the considerations with why this isn't just another one of those stories like we talked about at the start of this video. Uh, the Register Mail will refer to the people with Tyler Smith on the night of September 14th as friend one and friend two. The two individuals are not suspected of any foul play and no foul play is suspected in Smith's drowning as of the time of the writing of this article, which is December uh, 2018. And here is uh, Tyler's parents. Let's go ahead and get into the details here. Sandra Halsney and Keith Smith wanted answers for their son. They asked for ATM receipts, bank video, video from other sources throughout downtown Galesburg. They spoke to bartenders and pulled as much information from his cell phone as possible. That's one very good thing about this case. His cell phone is found on him. So some information that we're going to hear about through the media on this and We'll be talking to Tyler's family in this video as well, and we're going to ask them some more questions about that cell phone. Uh, quote, right after Tyler reached Galesburg, he called me, Halsney said, and just before 7 p.m., he spoke with his dad. Smith was supposed to stay overnight with friend one, then attend National Guard drill in Macomb for the last time. He was slated to complete a move to Concord, California days later and begin as a cadet in the police academy there. At 7 p.m., Smith and friend one went to Buffalo Wild Wings and ate dinner. An hour later, they met friend two at Duffy's on South Cherry Street. So let's bring up a map so we can try to track these movements. There's a lot of locations we're going to be talking about, but they're, most of them are clustered in one kind of area. The first one that isn't is this Buffalo Wild Wings, which is quite a bit north of where the rest of the locations are. Um, but if we drive down a little, little over three miles, that's where we get to all these other locations. Um, they went bar hopping, so there's a lot of bars that they uh, stop at on all this. But let's go ahead and follow to the next one. So uh, they met up with friend number two at Duffy's on South Cherry Street. Duffy's is right here. And continuing, friend two parked near Sitka Salmon on South Cherry Street. And friend one parked on the opposite side of the street. So Sitka Salmon is right here. So not too far from Duffy's, just kind of on the neighboring street on Simmons. Uh, and that is where they're parked. The three hopped from Duffy's to bar 65, and then sometime later went to Cherry Street bar. So for those locations, let's see, we've got Duffy's here, um, bar 65, actually kind of back here, Cherry Street Bar right here. So literally, it just looks like they're hopping from one location to the next, kind of heading up towards or up north on South Cherry Street. At Cherry Street Restaurant and Bar, Smith signed a debit card receipt there at around 10, 12 p.m. After 10, 12, uh, it's believed that they walked to Monkey Business. And we can see that is also kind of in the same cluster right across the street, essentially. So they roll up the street, hit these three places, jump across the street, go to monkey business. From there, at 1042, Smith and at least one of his friends were captured on the Wells Fargo ATM video camera located behind monkey business. And Smith withdrew $100. Uh, so the ATM, at least according to what Google's saying, is located right here. So uh, we're seeing they're just really... It kind of clustered in this particular area. But here we get some video. He's actually seen on video with his friend making the withdrawal from the ATM, pulling out a hundred bucks. So he pulls the hundred bucks and then just 10 minutes later, he signed a debit card receipt at the corner connection located on the corner of East Simmons and South Prairie streets. This one's a little different because corner connection a little bit out of the way, and I'm also I'm almost wondering if um, you know sometimes the credit card machines can have the times screwed up on them. I don't know if we're getting this kind of in legit order because this one seems odd. Like everything else is lining up real nice. We can see they're they're hanging out in this area. When they first show up, they're parked on this street. So I'm almost I'm almost wondering did they go there earlier, or I mean 
you know, maybe they did, maybe they cut back. I mean, it's not that far. We're talking a block and a half walk, but for that to be signed only 10 minutes later, you'd assume they needed enough time to order a drink, have the drink, um, unless they signed for it as soon as the drink was actually served to them, which is definitely a possibility. But so corner connection, another piece of this puzzle over here. Now, his mother points out something interesting here. Tyler's using his debit card to pay for the drinks, but then he goes and he gets cash. I don't know why he needed cash. It is kind of strange. He's using his debit card at all these places and then goes, hey, let me go to the ATM and pull a hundred bucks. Um, maybe he was worried about fees. Maybe he's like, hey, I'm getting hit for two bucks every time and I see there's a Wells Fargo over there. Let me just go pull some cash. But his, his mother does note that as, as seeming strange. At 11.05 p.m., Smith placed a call to friend one, which suggested that he had separated from the threesome. That call was not picked up. So it seems like we've got some type of separation that happens here. And uh, I don't know which friend is seen in the ATM video camera. I don't know if that's friend one or friend two, but I know there's only one person with him there. So it seems like somewhere in this, you know, 10, 30 to 11 range, one of the friend peels off. Uh, one of the friends peel off. According to information given to the Galesburg Police Department at roughly 1135, Smith, friend one and friend two walk to friend two's car back near Sitka Salmon. Uh, which kind of makes, maybe that's part of this whole hoop of them swinging out to corner connection. Maybe that's just the next closest bar that they like. And then from there, they get back to the vehicles. Uh, friend two left and last saw Smith and friend one walking in the direction of friend one's car across the street. At 1136, Smith called a friend in Macomb and they spoke for one minute. The Macomb friend said that Smith asked for his address and Smith said he was near the police station. Uh, his mother believes that the Macomb friend was under the impression that Smith meant the Macomb police station. Two minutes later, the Macomb friend texted his address to Smith, and then at 11.40, Smith, Smith texted back, coming. So this seems to me like there's a change in his plans, and I'm not really sure what's going on with that. We've got him supposed to stay with one of these friends um, that are you know, going to the same training that he is essentially the next morning. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, he heads towards the car with friend number one. And then in those few minutes, it seems like something changes. And I just, I don't understand it. Next, he's calling a friend. Uh, can I come stay with you? And this is not necessarily very nearby. At the same time, friend one texted his girlfriend. Uh, she assumed that he was home. He did in fact walk home and was not certain where Smith had gone. So maybe that plays into this. Maybe friend number one is like, hey, my girlfriend's going to come over. Is there some other place you can stay the night? Something along those lines, possibly. Smith sent his most enigmatic text at 11.41 p.m. It was to his friend in Macomb, and it read W-I-T-B-S-L-A, or is that capital I-A, 39-minute uh, walk. The friend has no idea what the text meant. Halsney has not been able to decipher its meaning. So Macomb, actually farther than I initially thought, uh, looks like driving its 49 miles, almost an hour long drive uh, from the center of Galesburg, at least. So that's kind of strange. He's reaching out to his friend in Macomb and saying, hey, I'm going to come stay with you. He doesn't have his car. Uh, his car, from what I understand, is back at friend number one's house. He didn't walk home with friend number one. He's now reaching out to his friend that lives a considerable distance away. Uh, it looks like, and, and this is just my assumption, possibly Tyler pulled up a map to see, to check uh, the address that his friend had sent. And Tyler might have assumed it was a 39-minute walk when in actuality it could have been a 39-minute drive. Uh, I've actually done that with Google Maps myself where I have the wrong icon hit and uh, I think it's a walk instead of a drive or vice versa. Uh, the other thing, uh, his mother saying that she's having trouble deciphering its meaning. I looked up, um, I kind of just had this intuition thinking, what would he say in a message like this? It seems like he's kind of complaining about the 39 minute walk. And it just really rolled off the top of my head quite easy. And I'm just going to put this out there because you guys can tell me if this is a thing or not. Uh, 
I think it means what is this BS? Uh, and then I thought that it was LA, but that might be a capital IA. I think he's trying to say, what is this BS long walk, long 39 minute walk? And WITBS actually does show up in an urban dictionary, which I know is not a super reliable source, but I just wanted to see, am I right about this WITBS? Do people use that in text language to say, what is this BS? In the urban dictionary, it actually does show up specifically for that. Um, I'm not positive that that's what's going on here, but that's just my thought in terms of that. But if you guys have other thoughts on what this message could mean, or if you know what it means, please drop that in the comments down below. One minute after the strange text, the Macomb friend received a call from Smith. Smith did not speak during the 24 second call, but the Macomb friend said there were sounds of two people laughing. Now that's pretty odd if we think that Tyler's on his own at this point his friend has already left he's supposedly trying to walk he thinks it's walkable and it, it really isn't and probably not in his condition um, two people laughing on what looks like a pocket dial at 11 46 p.m Smith sent his snapchat message to yet another friend noting I don't know where I am four minutes later the friend in Macomb received three random snapchat photos from Smith. Halsney said it appears the transmission of those photos was not intentional. So once again, seems like pocket dial. Um, she's even saying that here. We tend to think Tyler had his phone in his pocket and he was essentially butt dialing, not knowing his phone was going off. The friend in Macomb said the pictures were just random from that night, maybe. Uh, Halsney found what could be crucial evidence. In going through the phone, we noticed that Tyler had a health monitor. That health monitor noted Tyler stopped moving at 11.52 p.m. Friday, and he never moved again. Very critical information. Um, I'm curious if that might have had any type of location function attached to it. Uh, I know some of those health monitors kind of need location to understand how fast you're moving and that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm, I don't know specifically what app it is, but we'll see if we can learn more about that. Smith's phone continued to receive calls throughout the waning minutes of Friday, September 14th, and into the early morning hours of Saturday, September 15th. A total of five calls, three from the Macomb friend and two from friend one, rang on Smith's phone before being routed to voicemail in the early morning hours of September 15th. At 621, friend one attempted to call Smith to find out where he was and if he planned to attend drill. The phone did not ring and went straight to voicemail, indicating the phone's battery had died. Friend one called the Galesburg Police Department Saturday after Smith failed to show up for drill in Macomb. So really, uh, we've got the cluster of restaurants, the Wells Fargo ATM, then possibly swinging back to Corner Connection, then coming back to Sitka Salmon where the cars are, one friend leaving, uh, him heading towards the car with the other friend, something seemingly changes, and now he's on his own in this area ultimately winding up uh, not too far in terms of walking distance. And I don't think this path is accurate. This is the path if you had to drive to that area. Uh, if you were walking, uh, and we're actually going to find some information, he probably walked up uh, what is known as Northwest Street right over here. Um, but let's get to it. Let's keep rolling with this info here. The forensic pathologist determined all Smith's facial bones were intact, as well as his nasal septum, indicating he did not break his nose. This is kind of important information because the way that he's found is essentially face down, looking like he made a 17-foot fall. I mean, that's, that's what it looks like to me. His feet are kind of up against the wall very closely and in a way where it doesn't make a lot of sense that he would have been like walking around down there and then had some type of accident and his feet wind up perfectly against the wall. Um, so by the looks of it, him face down with his feet close to that wall on the south side of that water channel. Um, but if you made a 17 foot fall and landed in that manner, shouldn't there be some damage to your face? There is certainly some damage um, but 
a lot of people are questioning, is that damage actually related to the fall or is it something that happened to him previous to the fall and then he was placed in that location? Uh, so he did not break his nose. There was no external signs of neck injury, no indication of trauma. Mm. Uh, the family on their Facebook page has put up a couple pictures. I'm not going to show them here, but those photos to me uh, show some trauma to his face. Most, mostly what looks like bruising, honestly, on both sides, close to, close to his eyes. But there's also a very big scrape on one side of his face, and it almost looks like uh, like road rash. I mean, if you've ever taken a hard spill off of a, a bicycle or something like that, the type of scraping motion that is left, he's got one of those on his face. Uh, now, of course, if you're talking about a fall, you know, yeah, there's plenty of opportunity to you know to scrape it as you're falling. But the type of fall we're looking at here, where essentially it's straight down. It's not like it's on some angled hill or something like that. And he's going to roll and tumble. It's, it's a straight drop to that concrete. Uh, so the opportunities for scraping, I don't know, seem a little limited, but, uh, I, I'm not hundred percent sure about that. They do note here that the pathologist deemed superficial scrapes on his face, but his skull and scalp were intact. Uh, no visible fractures. His blood alcohol level was found to be 0.246 which, you know, these guys are bar hopping. They're visiting a lot of bars in a pretty short, confined period of time. Um, and, you know, we know he's buying, it seems like he's buying drinks at almost every location that he goes to. So uh, almost three times the legal limit on that. I requested x-rays of my son, his mother said. I wanted more than just the palpable tests and x-rays were not done. I saw the photos of my son. He had a big black eye on his right side, and it looked like there was damage done to his nose. Smith was found in an area of Cedar Fork surrounded by 20-foot walls on both sides. His feet were up against the south side wall with his body pointed out into the water. The muddy water was found in his lungs, uh, and that made it clear that he drowned. Now, another investigator that's been looking into this would probably question that, um, because from what I understand, there was none of the water actually collected as part of any crime scene investigation that happened at that site. So I believe there is no solid confirmation that any fluid actually found in his body did come from that water source specifically. Um, obviously, you know, I don't know how many different water sources it could have come from. The investigator is kind of alluding to the fact that sometimes through the decomposition process, there's natural processes where fluids will start to form in these areas. Um, and he was out there for what looks like, uh, probably somewhere around 18, 19 hours. The investigators can't tell us how he got into Cedar Fork, Halsney said. They don't think he was dropped or fell in, not from above where he was found. Now that's really odd. If the investigators don't think that he fell into that position, what do they think in terms of an accidental death? You know, that he was just stumbling around down there, happened to fall down with his face in the water in that way, and his body just perfectly lined up with the edge of the wall. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, the way I'm looking at it with the type of positioning we're talking about, you either have to believe that he did fall in from that side in a way that I'm even having trouble understanding in terms of like body tumble and how he would have landed in that particular configuration. But I, th I think it's possible uh, or something else happened to him. He's taken to that spot. He's put into that position to make it look like that's what happened. I mean, that's really, I think, the only two possibilities that are reasonable, particularly for, I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit of how his shoes wound up against the wall. But uh, And there's no way to know how deep the water was at the time, but I was told his shoes and socks were dry when they found him. Um I am going to include a video in the links down below that has some pictures. There's a news story. Uh, if you want to run through that, you'll see some photos of how his body was positioned and of how his clothes look. It, it looks like the water was certainly not very high at that time. And I'm not finding anything that says more than three inches. I'm seeing things vary a little bit between two and three inches for that water, but not much more than that. According to AccuWeather's timeline of temperatures in Galesburg, the high reached 88 degrees on September 15th. It's another thing I just wanted to touch on real quick. We've got a guy going through military training, about to enter the police academy, in good shape, 
probably knows a thing or two about defending himself. Like, you know, what's the likelihood? One of the scenarios I keep thinking of is like him just walking around and, you know, he's had too much to drink. Someone approaches him. Hey, give me your watch, something along those lines. How's that going to go down from there? Now, admittedly, you know, three times the legal limit, he's, he's had a lot to drink, but would he still be able to defend himself in some reasonable way to not wind up in that type of position? I would have to think so. So for me, um, I think I, I, I would be leaning towards more than one person that he's interacting with if we are talking about a, a foul play situation. Uh, Sandra Halsney said part of what motivates her belief that her son met with some kind of foul play before drowning is based on a time frame established by Tyler Smith's cell phone and surveillance footage from a business on the corner of Main and West Streets. So this is a different location. We haven't heard about this one yet. Sandra Halsney alleges surveillance footage shows Tyler Smith passing Casey's General Store at 11.48 p.m. Friday, September 14th. He was headed north in the general direction of the railroad tracks and Cedar Fork. So that is this additional location that I mentioned on West Street earlier. Casey's is right here. And if you continue up Northwest Street, you run right into Cedar Creek, and he's found basically right in this area here. So significant find in terms of footage that shows him walking in this direction. And once again, it's a discovery that's being made by his family. Sandra Halsney alleges a truck and a police car can be seen on the surveillance tape just minutes after her son passes down Northwest Street. It is clear from the geography of the area that if Tyler Smith walked to Cedar Fork on his own, he found a way around the barrier that separates Northwest from the grounds around the railroad tracks, or he walked west on East Ferris Street to North Academy, which places him very close to the tracks and just yards from Cedar Fork fork. Uh, both of those can be accomplished in four minutes. So just to show you a little bit of what they're talking about, they're basically giving kind of the two different routes, uh, either the straightforward route that I talked about, which now has a, a gate here and didn't have that a few years ago. Um, on one, We're going to do a little walk down the street on uh, Google Earth and it rolls back to some time frame where the gate wasn't there and there was actually a crossing here where cars could continue. Uh, so they're saying either he went that way, which lines up with what his mother's saying in terms of the direction that she saw on the footage from Casey's, uh, or, well, it still would line up with the direction. He could continue north here, then make the left on Ferris is what they're saying. Left on Ferris, right on North Academy, and that gets him kind of close to the same location. But considering his body's found over in this area, uh, I don't, I don't, I really don't know which one is more likely. So there is another way down to where he was found. Um, you have to get to it from a different road though. I think it's called water road and let's just take a look at it here. So as you can see on this side, we don't have that big fence. That fence actually starts here. Um, but this is, it's walkable. From what I understand, it's extremely steep, but you could theoretically walk down that to get to uh, the bottom and then just continue walking that way and eventually wind up where he's found. Um, so that's the other possibility for getting down there outside of, you know, falling off the edge or someone throwing you off the edge where he is located. Uh, the way to walk down there would be from over in this direction and then just continuing. Uh, here is Casey's, and this is heading in the direction of where he would be found. And you can see that for this block, um, if I zoom in, we could probably see there's certainly a fence there. And I don't know how far across that fence goes. I don't know if you could easily just, it looks like there's a little mound on this side. Can you just walk up the mound and step over the fence? I'm not sure. The road ends officially now at this location. Uh, it wasn't that way several years ago, apparently, because you'll see if we continue walking, this fence actually winds up disappearing on us and the road turns into, there we go. It turns into a road that goes all the way through. Um, but that's not how it is nowadays. Right now it's got this fence there. 
I'm also wondering a little bit just about this area. This is like some type of scrapyard or something that's here. Do people hang out around here, especially now that it's a dead end like this? Um, I don't know. Continuing with some information at news3wiu.com. Pictures taken by officials showed Tyler with his arms bent inward by his side with bruises, scratches, and marks on his body. Apparently, there are more marks on his body. We're going to get into some of those details as we continue. Uh, drag marks appeared to be on one of his shoes, but the other shoe looked clean. Tyler's watch was off his wrist laying next to him and a beer can laid next to the watch. Uh, Halsney said that according to the video, Tyler does not have a beer with him as he walked by Casey's. So that's kind of strange as well. Does the beer can belong to someone else? Uh, like I mentioned, if that is a dead end road like that, is that some place where people go sitting in their car, drinking up, having, you know, a, a get together of some kind with other people, maybe meeting up with dealers on a, a dead end road like that? I don't, I don't know. I think there's so many possibilities when it comes to potential for, uh, a stranger to be interacting with him. Um, it's, it's tough to try to figure out all those possibilities or, is that beer can part of this whole idea of this being staging of some kind? You know, someone want, wanting to make it look like he fell down to that position. Oh, and let's make sure there's a reasonable explanation for why, you know, his face is in the water and, and he's going to drown in that water. We'll leave a beer can right next to his body as well. Smith's family said they timed how long it would take Tyler to get from Casey's to the end of the street. That took four minutes. The family said that that's when Tyler's health app showed that he stopped moving at the fence. Tyler was spotted on Casey surveillance video at 11.48 p.m. and his app stopped working at 11.52. Um, yeah, that road, just knowing that his health app basically says that he stopped moving at the location of where that fence is really makes me think that he interacted with someone down there. I was able to find just some video. Uh, this is from the ATM shot. You can see Tyler in the foreground, uh, one of his friends in the background, and this is him pulling money. I think that's a vaporizer possibly, or a vape pen, sorry, in his mouth. Uh, and then this is footage from him walking down the street uh, from Casey's, so. Sandra and Keith keep pushing. They keep pushing and uh, about 13 months later, Really big developments start happening. They get a team together. Uh, I've talked about Gia Wright on a previous case. She's helping them. A retired uh, investigator also comes on board. This is from October 4th, 2019. Nearly 13 months after his death, Tyler Smith's parents gathered near where their 23-year-old son was found dead for a news conference. They want his body to undergo a second autopsy and a second investigation more than a year after his death. Gia Wright, founder and president of the nonprofit Missing Persons Awareness Network, and Mitchell Drake, a retired Chicago area police officer with years of homicide investigations, gave details Friday that seemed to point to missteps by local investigators and a forensic pathologist in Peoria who performed the initial autopsy. Some of those missteps mean potential evidence can't be recovered to help in a second investigation now. Uh, what are those accusations? We're going to get into those more as we continue through a few different articles here. His parents want the Illinois State Police to come on for the second investigation. Galesburg Police Captain Rod Riggs said Friday afternoon that GPD had previously contacted ISP about the case. We talked to them about it on several occasions. They never took it. Uh, what's interesting is the family also talked to ISP and at least the people they were talking to said, uh, you know, Galesburg basically would not give us the case uh, or Galesburg didn't even talk to us about the case. So kind of different stories happening around that. But admittedly, we're talking about organizations where, you know, you have a bunch of different people working near the end of the news conference. Drake addressed a question that has taken off on social media. It was his belief that local law enforcement had nothing to do with Smith's death and that marks seen on Smith's body around his ankles had likely been there for days before his death. Um, I haven't run into information, at least in major media sources, about the marks around his ankle, so I'm not sure what the uh, assumption is around that. Uh, I am seeing some other mentions about like uh, tasers, so I don't know if that's related to that, that 
there was, you know, some stuff kicking around social media that maybe he had been tased or something like that. I saw that one of the uh, GPD was coming out very strongly with, you know, this whole idea that he was tased is is ridiculous. Um, back to uh, Drake's information. He also said that there are easier places in Galesburg to attempt to conceal and dump a body than Cedar Fork. Quote, if this was a body dump, this is one of the last places one would pick, he said. Uh, I don't know that I think this is a planned body dump or a well thought out body dump. It seems to me that I'm really feeling like this is an opportunity situation, that it was just whatever happened to him might have happened at the end of that street. The people that were involved with that said, oh, we've got to move him to a location, make this look like an accident. I think I think that's a possibility that really needs to be considered in all this. Uh, over at kwqc.com, uh, just some more information about the details that came out in this press conference. No crime scene technician was contacted or responded to the scene. His feet were close to the canal's wall and he was face down. The way his body's positioned is one of the findings Drake said is suspicious. He also says there was no examination of his hands for foreign DNA or scrapings taken from underneath the nails, and no instruction was given to the pathologist to conduct those scrapings. Um, just to show you the picture real quick, here is how his feet were found. And the edge of the wall, if, if you look real close, there's a line right here. That's actually the edge. I know it's kind of hard because the concrete's the same color, but essentially his right foot is practically right up on the concrete at the edge of the wall. His left one is out a little bit, just maybe by an inch or two. Uh, and you can see his shoes. It does look like dragging to me. Um, I've actually read Drake's report and Drake doesn't think that that's dragging, but um, Drake's report thinks that there's blood on his shoes. Maybe I'm not seeing that on this photo. This really looks to me like that foot was dragged. Uh, it almost looks like there's a grass stain right at, right at the tip of it, but the top just, I don't know. I don't know. And it looks like his shoes were relatively kept pretty clean. That mark is just really, really odd to me. There are wounds on both sides of the victim's face and head and marks around the wrist, back of his hand and back that are not adequately explained. Uh, Tyler Smith likely suffered a battery by persons not yet known that directly led to his death. He was likely unconscious prior to his final placement in Cedar Fork Creek. Chief Russ Idle released a statement on this. He said, we're not pursuing any active leads at this time. If any new information becomes available, we'll pursue it. All evidence indicates an accidental death. Uh, Captain Rodney Riggs also kicked out a statement. The Galesburg Police Department stands by its findings in its case. We did not find any indications that foul play was involved in this case. Um, and those statements actually don't really counter what Drake's saying. Drake's basically saying they never looked at it from that point of view at all. So why would they expect to have found anything, you know, marking foul play if they didn't conduct those types of tests? From what I understand, they did bag his hands, uh, which is a move to prep them for further analysis, but the further analysis essentially never happens. Over at WQAD.com, some more information from Drake. He also said uh, the pathologist was not supplied with enough accurate information to warrant a more detailed and accurate autopsy. The pathologist conducted a routine autopsy with a preconceived idea that it was an accidental drowning. His mother stated, we are asking that Illinois State Police take a further look into our son's death. We would be able to accept what is said and would have had this been done properly the first time. We miss our son, and as hard as it would be for us to allow his body exhumed for a second autopsy, we are to the point that we understand it's important for answers, for finding the truth. Yeah, I can't believe making that decision. Um, but this is a person that believed in justice, and if anyone deserves it, I think it's someone that was looking to help his community be a part of finding bad guys. And uh, if there's a bad guy responsible for this, I think that is certainly the best way to honor Tyler. Over at PeoriaPublicRadio.org, very big news in September of 2020, Illinois State Police reopen investigation into Army National Guardsmen found dead in 2018. 
The Illinois State Police Division of Criminal Investigations is now looking into the 2018 death of an Army National Guardsman in Galesburg. The ISP declined to comment further, citing the ongoing investigation. And we also hear that the family has stepped up that reward. They're now offering $25,000 for information leading to an arrest. Uh, what happened that reopened this case? We're going to find some more info here at WQAD. A second autopsy was completed in July. Those results are under wraps as this is an open and ongoing investigation. Quote, we finally feel like this is getting an investigation, Halsney says. When we finally got that second autopsy, it was just like a sigh of relief, but it also brought up a lot of emotions. The exhumation was tough. No parent should have to do their own son's investigation and no parent should have a second reburial and plead for help. She says she believes Smith's cause of death will change after this investigation. Uh, also, to honor their son, Halsney and Smith's dad, Keith Smith, held the second annual Tyler Smitty Smith 5K to raise money for a fund in Smith's name at the Rochelle Community Fund. It's something close to Tyler's heart, something police and military related, Halsney says. It's to keep something positive going, to look forward to and honor Tyler for years and years to come. So it really sounds like we've got some big turns, good turns in this case. And here at rrstar.com, I don't know if this information, because it seems like they were going to keep it pretty tight on the autopsy information, but here sounds like at least this came out. Smith's death is now ruled to have an undetermined cause. That is quite a bit different from the earlier news stories that were saying that it was effectively accidental death by means of drowning. Uh, that accidental category, manner of death, um, that would be either accident, homicide, um, suicide, or undetermined. So this sounds like the manner has been changed. Quote, it has been a long two years fighting for answers and getting someone to listen, but we feel very happy to have help looking into what happened to our son, Halsney said. They've been working with our family giving us updates and keeping an open line of communication between us and them. We trust that they will seek and investigate all leads and are willing to truly find out what happened to Tyler. The community has been very supportive there in Galesburg, and we hope if anyone has any information that they will reach out to Illinois State Police. What about the Galesburg PD? What do they say about this? I found one little quote over at WIFR.com. 23 News reached out to Galesburg Police Chief Russell Idle for comment. He says... At this time, we are going to let the state police take a fresh look at the investigation and assist in any way possible. But right now, we've got a few very important guests to bring into this conversation, the mother and father of Tyler Smith. And joining us now is Tyler's mom, Sandy Halsney. And from what I understand, Tyler's dad, Keith, is in the room somewhere too, but he's just running support and production duties for us on this episode, so... Just want yeah, to welcome correct. you both. Thank you so much Thank for you. spending some time here and uh, for reaching out and letting me know about this case. Um, I know you guys haven't seen the segments that I've recorded so far, but we have a lot of cases that follow a trend of young man, early 20s, goes out drinking with friends, somehow gets separated from the friends, and then mm -hmm. either they disappear or unfortunately, tragedy of some kind strikes. Um, but, and when I first was contacted by you, I was like, oh no, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. one of, it's one of these cases and, and mm -hmm. they're, they're very difficult to help. But once you start getting into the details on this and to see that you guys found help and have turned this into a new, fresh investigation, um, mm -hmm. it's so motivating. And I just, I really wanted to be sure to help help Thank your you. cause, but also help spread this story so for other family members that are out there Absolutely. dealing with, because this situation happens over and over and over. I'm telling you several times a year, we're talking about this. So, yeah. um, and for anyone that's, you know, a young man in your early twenties, please be careful. Don't leave those friends. Just don't leave mm -hmm. them behind. It's such a tough mm -hmm. thing. Um, Something that really moved me looking into the coverage, and at some point I'm going to let you talk. It's just I feel <laughs> like I have so much. I can't hug you guys physically, mm -hmm. um, but I want to kind of give you guys a virtual hug. The unified front mm -hmm. that you and Keith have had 
every heart-wrenching moment that I've seen in the videos, the pictures that I see in the articles, it's so clear that there is a good, strong basis for a family that is still running through all this that I'm thankful for because sometimes families get pushed to extreme pressures with this. Oh, absolutely. Um, how do you guys do this? How are you getting through day to day at this point dealing with um, this? When Tyler passed away, um, it was very difficult, obviously. And we made a pact. We just said, you know what? We have to be here for each other. And, um, you know, I'm more the boisterous one. Yeah. Um, I'm more, I'm, I'm more the electronic, you know, you know, digging and, and getting the information and, and Keith is like a supporter, you know, um, every time I hit a brick wall, I felt like, Oh, I can't do this anymore. And he just go, you know what, we've hit a brick wall and then something else comes in. And, you know, just to have that support, and knowing that there's someone there backing you when you feel like no one else is, yeah, you know, I mean, we all have our days, let's face it, but you know, you have to stick together to, to get through this. Whenever I speak, we both lost a child, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Whenever I speak to families that are facing tough things like this, I really try to encourage them to work. And, and I think Tyler would really appreciate this work like a team. Like right. to recognize your strengths and to play to those strengths. Maybe mm -hmm. one of you is the person that's the media face. Maybe mm -hmm. one of you is the person like you're talking about with Keith, the support role that is there mm -hmm. to keep you propped up when things are getting tough. Um, but you guys did such a great job putting an extended team together as well. Uh, I'm right. becoming a fan of Gia's. I've actually bumped into Gia on a mm -hmm. few cases at this point, mm -hmm. And I really appreciate what she does. Yeah, um, she's... Yeah. And then we've got this investigator that is helping you as well. But mm -hmm. um, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. I got to know, what was Tyler like growing up? I see just a shining example of a young man and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of pictures of a, fa a loving family that I can see on the Facebook page. What, what was he like as a kid? Um, as a child, he was just always on the go. Um, loved every sport. Um, he didn't have much fear as far as trying new things. Um, he was very passionate about everything he did. Um, he was an AB student, had a lot of friends, all walks of life. Um, you know, we grew up in a small town of like, I think there's like 9,000 people here in Rochelle, Illinois, and we lived here our whole life. And he just, he was, um, easygoing fun, laughed a lot, had a great personality. He wasn't perfect, but it just, he didn't really have any enemies. And it was very clear to us that after he passed away, how many lives he really truly did touch. But, um, I mean, he could do anything. I mean, yeah. skydive and someone said, Hey, you want to go play hockey? Never played hockey, got out there and played it. Wow. You know, I mean, his next big, big venture was I'm moving to California. I'm going to surf. You know, yeah. that's my next thing. And he just was very passionate about his future. He always knew what he wanted to do as a child. He wanted to be in the army and he wanted to be a police officer. And he knew that from first grade. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing to be committed to a lifelong dream like that. Yeah. Um, are there any siblings? Was Tyler a only child or? Um, Tyler is an only child with Keith and I, yes, okay. Okay. but he does have, um, some half sisters and a half brother. Okay. Okay. And I have to imagine this has been tough on them. Are they younger? Um, one younger brother. Okay. That's gotta be especially tough. Yeah. Yeah. They were very close, very close and they look a lot alike. So it's, it's hard because I know Kevin is very quiet, um, I think Tyler was more the like outgoing kid and he holds it all in a lot. He's yeah. a lot like his dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, but it was, it's tough on Kevin. It's, they were very close. You know, Kevin's about to get married this year and he was supposed to be his best man. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know Tyler will be there. I know Tyler will be yeah, there. For, for sure. Um, what was one of your favorite recent memories with Tyler? What's the last good time you remember um i have to say the time he came home 
um, we had like a party of all parties. Um, it was his birthday is the 12th, mine's the 13th of September. So that Sunday prior to that, we had a big cookout and it was, it was kind of ironic because, you know, he was also moving to California um, within about a week of that time. And so it was like, his brother was going to SIU. It was my birthday. It was my niece's birthday. It was his birthday. You know, Tyler was got this job in San Jose. He was moving to California. So we just, a lot of his friends came over. Um, we had like three birthday cakes. We just had this huge outpour of just love that day and made so many memories and had so many pictures. And that's probably my most favorite last memory of Tyler is, you know, he saw so many people and got to, you know, people that he hadn't seen in maybe a year or so came to that, you know, function, you know, that cookout that we had. And it was like, almost like it was meant to be, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, in a way it just tugged at my heart again. Cause I, I realized when I was filming the stuff earlier, Tyler passed away just a matter of days after his birthday but Correct. I didn't know it was also just a day after yours. Yeah. Mm. Two, two days. Well, we think either a day or two days. We're not yeah. sure exactly the actual, he was, he was pronounced dead two days after my birthday Yeah. and three after his, he had just turned 23. But what, what a, a beautiful upside to that, that you guys had a reason to have that big celebration yeah. and get all together yeah. like that. Wow. Yeah. Um, the justice for Tyler Facebook page uh, is just a beautiful memorial and you can see it's a story of an amazing family and community rallying support mm -hmm. around this terrible tragedy the pictures mm -hmm. uh just just going to the photos tab it was like it, it look at all these beautiful photos look at all these beautiful family moments and then oh my mm -hmm. goodness here's a shot of his grave marker which by the way one of the most impressive graves grave scenes that I've ever seen. I mean, just with the, yeah. the, the pictures, the headstone is beautiful, the imagery, the words. Um, but it just, it grabs at your heart in such a way. I want everyone to go check it out. Of course, there's a link in the description box down below. Mm -hmm. When did you hear that something was wrong? I mean, you, you come off, he's coming home, you know, he's getting ready for the move. You have the big party. When do you hear that? Hey, something's not right. So he left Friday, the 14th. Um, he decided that he was going to go stay with, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, he was going to go stay with a friend from drill. He drilled in Macomb, Illinois, and he usually stayed in Macomb, but the person that he stayed with most of the time, his place was full. Okay. So he thought, okay, I'll stay there Saturday night, Friday night. I'll stay with this other guy. Never met the guy you know, thinking Tyler's a responsible adult, you know, sure. okay, you know, just let us know when you get there. And so he stayed in Galesburg, Illinois, which is about a 40 minute drive to where he um, drilled at. But from home, it's like two and a half hours. So he figured the closer I get, the less, you know, formations at 7am. I don't have to drive so far in the morning and yeah. get up so early Yeah, because he basically came home just to turn his the equipment in. Um, that was the whole purpose of him even coming home and to move to California. And, and he was transferred to another unit that he'd already drilled with in California to, okay. to sign paperwork for. So that was his main goal. So when he stayed with this, this um, associate from, from the Army National Guard drill, that's why he was there. He'd never been there before. Um, except for one time, and that was with me actually, because Tyler went to Western Illinois University, which was in Macomb. Okay. And so um, there was a mother's weekend, and all the hotels were packed. And the closest place um, his roommate's mom and I could stay was in Galesburg. So that's the only time he'd been there was with me. Um, and, but we didn't go do anything while we were there. We okay. were in Macomb. Okay. So he, and this is what's referred to as friend number one in the article, Correct. right? Okay. Correct. Okay. And his car is actually left at friend number one's house on this night, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that. Um, 
did did that friend ever explain why the plans changed or why they separated from each other at the end of the night? No. Uh, I had reached out to him as a mother um, after Tyler passed away, just checking in on him and just saying, hey, you know, um, how you doing? You know, like trying to reverse the roles. Like if this was my son that was alive and, you know, um, I would expect Tyler to jump in and help and do whatever he can to support the family, do whatever. Right. That's just how Tyler was raised. Um, but when I reached out to him, he was at first, Hey, you know, I'm here for you guys. You come to, you come to Galesburg, we'll get dinner. You know, you're like family to me. Tyler was, you know, really close to me. You know, I really never heard of this kid before, but that doesn't mean that they weren't close. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but he then, as weeks went by, I had issues with the Galesburg PD helping me, like in answering any questions. They just kept blowing me off. And so I reached out to him. I said, hey, you know, could you just give me a timeline of when Tyler got there? Because he claims he doesn't remember. He was too intoxicated. Yeah. He doesn't remember how they separated. Hmm. So I said, can you just give me a timeline of from when Tyler got there until you don't remember. And his statement to me, and that's the last time I spoke to him, is um, I've already given my statement to the police and um, I am the least likely to be able to help you. Wow. That's such a weird and phrasing. I yeah, yeah. I don't understand that. Um, I mean, I know, maybe either. he's getting frustrated with all the questions or something, but I mean, you would think he would just spend the time or at least give you the same information in the statement. It, do you know, is he related yeah. to law enforcement? Does he have any family that works for GPD? Not that I'm aware of. No. Hmm. Yeah. No. Uh, one of the things I was just in the way that the information came out in one of the articles, I was wondering, and maybe you have some insight into this. Maybe you don't. These guys are bar hopping. And it seems like they're going at a pretty rapid clip. Do you mm -hmm. do you get the feeling that they were out like trying to find girls or? You know, I don't know. I know the one had a girlfriend. Tyler was kind of like still in a relationship. Um, he was moving to California. So I'm not sure what the status was on that. Okay. I think they were trying to decide what they were going to do at that point. Um, I think they were just like, hey, you know, I'm moving to California. I just turned 23. I just had a birthday and let's go have some drinks and then celebrate. They went out to eat yeah. first. Yeah. Um, and the bars are very close. They're like next door to each other. We so it's like that. one street of bars, yeah. basically. Yeah. So they just stuck at one and then they'd go to the next one and they'd go to the next one. And uh, Galesburg's a town of like 30,000 people. So that bar scene is literally just in that area. Okay. So I think it's just a normal thing for them to me. I think that they just jumped from one or maybe they wanted to show Tyler, Hey, let's go, uh, you know, let's go to this one or let's go to that one. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'm just bringing that up because it did make mention that friend number one winds up texting his girlfriend pretty much at about the time. It seems like him and Tyler are splitting. And I was just yeah. wondering if he had told Tyler like, Hey, I'm going to have my girlfriend come over. Is there some other place you can stay? Cause then we have Tyler reaching out to his friend in Macomb, right? Right. Thinking he can walk there when it, it's it's not possible to make that mm -hmm. walk. Um, right. We don't. I think there was um, from what I'm understanding now that there was um, miscommunication with the friend in Macomb and Tyler. He thought Tyler was in Macomb. Right. Right. And Tyler said he was by the police station. Right. And so at that point, that's why he went out looking for Tyler and couldn't find him. Um, but there was miscommunication from what we're hearing now, Tyler really never said, Hey, you know, thinking he was in Macomb, he just, they, they just assumed he was okay. in Macomb. Gotcha. So from what we are hearing now that Tyler never really said, Hey, I'm in Galesburg and I'm coming there. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. it was just a, like a miscommunication kind of. Well, and then we have, the, hearing. you know, the friend sends him the address and then that last well, one of the last messages, it mm -hmm. sounds like he clicked on the address and it opened a map app on his phone. And the map app was telling him it was a 40 something minute drive. And he thought that mm -hmm. it was a walk. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. And I always wondered too, you know, did he think he was calling another friend or, but then 
you know, I don't think so because I mean, he, he you know, I don't know. Yeah. You know, the, the, those are the, the, the things that I've always wished I could figure out, you know, but your mind goes in a hundred and million different ways. Yeah. The phone uh, seems like such a, a critical piece of, of the puzzle here. And of course you made the really interesting discovery about the health app on the phone. Right. Does that include location tracking information? No, it does not. It only includes distance, time, and steps. Okay. Okay. Because one of the articles kind of made it sound like, um, almost like the app noted that when he got to the end of that street, that that's where it, it says he didn't move anymore. And I was just wondering, because the end of that street where they have the gate now, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, it just seems a little seedy. You've got kind of that scrap yard on one side, a business on the mm -hmm. other. That's just a solid wall. Like, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. are there some guys hanging out down there and he just bumps into a bad element or something? I think um, actually it's about the two minute mark is where if we've timed it out to if he concluded to walk down to that very dead end. Yeah. That two minute part, part, he pauses. And then for two minutes, he's either running or moving aggressively. Oh. Because we can tell by the time, distance, and steps. Okay. Does it show an elevation in his heart rate or anything around running? No. It, did, it, didn't, it didn't show that. Okay. Wow. Because he was not wearing an Apple Watch or Fitbit or anything. It was just off of his phone. Yeah. Yeah. That he was walking with. Okay. Was there any damage to his phone? Absolutely not. He had no protector on it. Um, had no water damage. Works perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, no cracks, no breaks. And iPhones, we all know. Oh, no yeah. iPhones, but you drop them and they're going to crack unless you, unless you have a screen protector and there wasn't even a screen protector and there was, and it was not, a, it was not locked. Okay. Either. It wasn't locked. Like there was no password on it. No. Okay. Okay. Um, I heard on the Nancy Grace podcast, a pretty terrible story, but I want to make sure that everyone that's watching this hears it as well. And that's the story around the Wells Fargo video. <laughs> Yes. And um, finding Tyler as opposed to having the investigators tell you he's not there. Can you just tell us what happened around all that? Um, I had provided um, probably about within a week or so, maybe or less. I can't remember um, information that Tyler had taken money out of his ATM. And he I had the exact location, the exact um, time everything so it was just get a hold of wells fargo get a warrant and get us the information let's look at this video yeah and by the end of october he said to me hey we got the video and tyler's not on it i said that just can't be true that can't be true i've i mean well if it was true it, it could mean something significant like someone else is using his card which we're looking for right. a criminal element and yeah so yeah yeah Okay. So I'm like, okay, well now what? He's like, well, I'm off hunting for the next month. So it'll probably be December before we get another video and request in to Wells Fargo. Cause that's how long it takes. I'll, I'm, cause at first he was just like, well, he's just not on it. And I'm just like, well, can you send another request? Because he's gotta be on it. And he's just like, well, I guess I can. And I'm just like, are you kidding me right now? Like, why wouldn't you? And so I pressed for him to do it. He did it. And um, then I said, well, since you're going to be gone for the whole month, who is my go-to person? And he just said, well, you know, if there's something that comes through in the mail, they'll call me. I'm like, no, I want to name in a number of somebody that I can contact if I have any questions. So he gave me a sergeant's number. The detective didn't tell me that there would be a copy coming of the warrant. And I guess well, Far Wells Fargo sends you a copy to your home address. So they send it to my family's home in California and they took a, a picture of it. And I said, send it to me. And they took a picture of it. And I noticed it was a Saturday night. And I noticed there was an extra zero on the warrant that wasn't on his account. So I was freaking out. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're going to get the wrong video again. You know, this is ridiculous. So I left a message for the sergeant. 
And then I think it was Veterans Day that day. It was a Monday in November. And I went, no one would call me. So myself, a friend of mine and Keith went and drove the four hour round trip to Galesburg and showed up there. And just, I asked for the sergeant. I said, did you get my message? And he said, yes. And I just said, were you going to call me back? And he just said, well, what can I help you with? And I just said, well, I'm concerned we're going to get the wrong video because the detective originally told me it was the wrong video from the wrong bank. Right. And I said, you know what? I, I can't wait till December for this. You know, time's ticking. And so he said to me, you know what? I'll just put it in my computer and I'll prove it to you. It's not the wrong bank. It's the wrong time frame. Okay. And I'm like, okay. So he puts it in his computer and he's sitting there and he's telling me, you know, you know, this is the bank. See, this is the bank. You can go down there. I'm like, I've already been down there. I've, I've even tested the bank and taken money out of that bank to see if the timestamp was correct on it myself. Mm. Wow. Wow. Which they hadn't done. Yeah. But, um, thinking, okay, what's wrong here? Why aren't they getting the right stuff? Mm -hmm. So he's sitting there and he's very cocky and he's very rude and, you know, basically treating me like, you just need to move on, you know, which he'd already told us once prior, you yeah. know, I think it was just weeks after Tyler died. You guys just need to move on. And all of a sudden he says, you know, I just don't know what more you want me to do. What the f do you want me to do? Your son drown. <sighs> and I just... I had to take a deep breath and I'm like, I know he just didn't say that to me. Yeah. And as soon as he said that, here comes Tyler and the two men he was with that night showing up on the video at the exact time, the exact location, the everything he was, it was in their possession since October for like three or four weeks. It's almost like the universe right. wanted him to look like an idiot. Like after that moment yeah. of him lashing out at you. I like, don't know if it's divine intervention or what, <laughs> yeah. but I was wow. like, that's Tyler. Like, and I was so upset at that point. I'm like, and Keith just said to him, well, what are you going to do? And he's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to talk to my detective and find out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and that he just dropped the marbles. He dropped the ball. And I'm just like, well, that's not acceptable, Yeah, you know, because we're sitting here trying to figure out what happened to our son and we've been open and honest with you. And now we're feeling like we're being lied to. Yeah. And why? And now my trust at that point was broken. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it just got worse from there. Uh, now you did, you did mention uh, in that footage, I've only seen a little clip that one of the news segments did with that footage. And they only had one of his friends with him in that. What were both friends actually there? Yeah, they were. One was off to the side, off of the camera a little bit. Okay. He okay. kind of stayed further back. And that was the cousin of the friend. Okay. That Got met it. him out. Got it. Yeah, such a terrible story. Um, and, and how wouldn't your faith be rattled in their abilities when oh, you have absolutely. that type of absolutely. moment? Absolutely. Yeah. At that point, I was like, you know what? I want to file a complaint. I want to FOIA everything I possibly can. I want everything, you know? Yeah. Um, we found out that the detective at that point didn't even dump Tyler's phone, that mm. he'd already given it back to us. Wow. He didn't even dump it. Wow. There was no record of that. Um, he, we found out he was running for county board at the time, and, and he just either completely just blew us off because he just figured, I don't care. Yeah. Or there's more to it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And that's something that I know I saw some criticism about online comments and, you know, some of the information makes you wonder when you see surveillance footage and you're saying, well, you know, a police cruiser shows up in that surveillance footage moments later. Um, mm -hmm. Your detective has been pretty clear. He doesn't think that there's any police involvement in what happened to Tyler. Uh, are mm -hmm. you guys on the same page? Um, you know, it's hard to be on the same page when you've been lied to and lied to and lied to. Yeah. And you just, the, the neglect just from that, there's more, you know? So it wasn't just, they were caught being neglectful, but we caught them being neglectful right after that lying about camera surveillances that showed exactly probably what happened to Tyler. And they said that they checked it and it was only good for the weekend. It was good for seven days. 
And they lied to us and told us they checked it. And actually, it was the same day that we found out that Tyler was on this ATM video. Keith went down and spoke to the owner of this business. And he said, the police have never been down here to check my, my cameras. Yeah, yeah. This is now November. And so the trust issue is that now I've turned in a formal complaint. Now they don't want to deal with me. Right. And um, I'm just a nuisance to them. And every time I would ask for help, like just Tyler's phone location history, which I own the phone. It was, he was on my, he was on my um, account. Mm -hmm. And, um, but because of the company, um, you have to have either a police officer or a judge require a warrant to get that information. They yeah. would not give it to me. So, so um, I asked them to do that. And they said, the first, the, the second investigator after the complaint gave me hope, like, hey, yeah, let's do that. Right. And then about two or three days later, he, he returns my phone call and says, you know what? I'm sorry, but I've been told we're not going fishing for anything. And they just refused at that point. It was only good for a year. And I asked and asked and asked and they just would not do it. Yeah. And this is all on the heels of feeling like you guys didn't even get a decent autopsy performed. Correct. And then you have the weird thing where the autopsy was scheduled for Monday and then it got bumped ahead and it was done on Sunday. Yeah. And it, there does seem to be a feeling of we just want this wrapped up and closed out and yeah. move on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, was his wallet and his cards and his cash. Now I know it seems like the hundred dollars that was pulled might've disappeared, but he had other cash in his wallet as well. Right. Was all that found with him? So we don't know how much originally he had on him Okay. when he took the cash out. Okay. Um, I know he had come home with cash. I don't know how much he left with, um, but he only had, I think it was $72 on him when he was found in some change. Um, they can't tell me what pocket was in, you know, where the wallet was, where the phone was. They didn't document anything because on the scene, the police had the fire take everything out of his pockets before the investigator or the coroner even got there. Hmm. And they didn't document anything. So, did and they, they think it was a life saving effort? Were, were they? Well, they weren't doing CPR. Okay. Um, they said more it was about finding out who he was before it went out on Facebook that a body was found or, oh, you know, they said it was more to protect the family. And I just said, well, did anybody try to revive my son or yeah. anything? And they said, no. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I'm just saying in terms of robbery being something that happened here outside of the hundred dollars, which we're not sure of because he pulled that early enough in the evening. We know he does go to another bar, at least one other bar mm -hmm. after that mm -hmm. seemingly uses his debit card again, but we know right. that he is still kind of bouncing around. Plus he walks by that store. Did he actually go into that store or what, did he just walk by it? No, he okay. just walked by it. Okay. So yeah, it's possible that, you know, he spent some money somewhere and that's, uh, that's the change, I guess. Well, the one thing is we know is that once he started walking, he was continuously walking once he left the last place he, that we know right. of. Right. right. Like we don't think he stopped anywhere else at that point because he, on his health app, you can see he's continuously walking. Okay. Uh, was anything found to be missing from him? We don't know. I mean... It doesn't seem to be his debit cards were there, his right. license, his military ID. Um, he, his phone was in his pocket, unlocked, not ruined. Yeah. Um, his uh, watch, his watch was, was off of him still clasped, but it was broken at the pin of the face of the watch and it was bent. So like someone pulled it off of him. Okay. But it was laying next to him about a foot from his hand. Wow. Okay. Um, and I've seen some mention about glasses. Did he normally wear glasses? Yeah. So he had sunglasses on that night. And even in the ATM video, you can see that he has them on, but he wears them on the back of his head and crosses them back. Yeah. And those were never recovered. Okay. 
Okay. So that's the only thing that I can see that's missing. And of course, then his clothes and shoes we never received. Yeah. Well, I didn't find a really good um, explanation of what happened with that stuff. You want to just share with the audience what happened with his clothes? Well, um, when Tyler was found, I had asked to see him and ID him because I'm his mother. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, his whole body is evidence. And he's in a body bag and it's zip tied. And a police officer that drilled with him a couple of times, I need him for you. And I said, but I want to see him. And they said, he's not here. I said, I want to go. I'll go. I'll go wherever he's at. And I want to see him. And they said, no, they refused for me to see him. They wouldn't tell me where he was at. They just said he was going to go for an autopsy to a forensic pathologist because his whole body was evidence. So I assumed it's whole body is evidence. You're going to keep his clothes. You're going to keep his shoes. You're going to keep it all, right? No. They did a 30-minute autopsy, basically just one of like somebody that dies of natural causes, really. And um, no detective came to his autopsy to claim any DNA, even though they backed his hands. Um, they, obviously, she's not going to keep his clothes. So um, his clothes went to the funeral home. And I was told that his clothes were there at the funeral home and I wanted them. Mm -hmm. But you got to remember, this is four days after he died. And it's the first time I've got to view my son. Yeah. And I wanted the clothes. I just said, well, I want them. And, I'm, you know, unfortunately, I think people were thinking they were looking out for me. But everybody was like, you don't want them. You know, he laid deceased in them for maybe possibly up to 19 hours. They're full of water, and mud. Um, you know, they're, you know, you don't want to traumatize yourself with that, Sandy. You don't need those clothes because we were told that he only had a scratch and a bump on his face. So I just, hey, it's an accident. You know, he drowned. I mean, I was told he was found in a creek. Right. So where I come from, a creek is like a small river, yeah. you know? Yeah. At that point, I didn't know where he was found. I didn't, you know, I, that was one of my biggest regrets yeah. is not taking those clothes. And then they've got, they got thrown away. Wow. Um, one of the things about the clothes that is kind of sticking out in my mind is the mark on his shoe. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you're, I don't know if um, the investigator that you're working with, Drake, if he agrees, it seems like he doesn't think that's a drag mark. And admittedly, I'm only looking at it from a photo. It mm -hmm. kind of looks like what would happen if someone was being lifted by someone else or dragged across mm -hmm. grass. Um, Drake seems to think mm -hmm. there's blood that was on one of his shoes. Is he talking mm -hmm. about that same mark or is it in a different area? It's, in a, it's not like around the shoestring area of the shoe. Okay. Um, so to me, I feel like if there's blood on the shoe, it's either Tyler's blood because we know that he has an injury to his chin. Yeah. Um, so that means that with gravity, it's dripping down or it's someone else's blood. Um, we know he was bleeding. So um, we, right. you know, but there, there is a chance that, and then there's also a mark on his shoe. One of his shoes actually is ripped. Okay. Um, the one that's actually clean, really clean yeah. is ripped. Um, and this is all things that I have like really truly looked at. And um, actually found all this before even, you know, I got an investigator's things I've been pointing out to people. But, you know, I even pointed it out to the police like, hey, you know, look at this. And they just, you know, they just shrug their shoulders and go, well, we don't have that anymore. But yeah. we have photos. But. Yeah, well, and even the situation you're talking about, if you have, you know, some type of wound from his face that's bleeding and it's dripping down to his shoe. Sure, that makes sense if the attack happened with him standing up, but mm -hmm. the story we're supposed to believe seemingly from the way his body is placed is that he fell from right above there, mm -hmm. landed in the position that he likely landed in, and that's where those injuries would have likely occurred. So how would the blood mm -hmm. have gotten to the top of his shoe um, mm -hmm. doesn't really make a lot of sense. And looking at the photos of his face, that scrape just sticks out to me. It just, mm -hmm. I don't understand how that scrape that is, happens. That, that's like a, a road rash scrape to yes. me, you know, 
um, where his face is being rubbed up against maybe concrete of some sort. Now he was found on a concrete drainage ditch. Yeah. But, you know, this is more like almost like he was fighting to get free, you know, scrape, you know, rubbing up against something. Yeah. Um, he has injuries on both sides of his face. Yeah. He has yeah. 29 injuries, actually. Yeah. I was going to ask about that because I've only really seen the photos of his face in particular. Um, mm -hmm. I did see some mention of uh, some types of injuries around his wrists, something to do mm -hmm. with his ankles. Mm -hmm. Um, what, is there more around his torso? Yes, actually his hip area, they mentioned, um, some deep muscular issues, um, no leg injuries to show that he would have jumped, you okay. know, um, he has, I think it's his, I don't have it right sitting in front of me, but he has, I think it's his right shoulder has very deep muscular um, injury to it in the axillary area, like the armpit area and the top of the shoulder and the back of the shoulder area. Right. How did he get injuries on both sides of his face, both legs, behind his knees, his ankle, his wrists have marks on them. Um, he's missing skin from one of his wrists. Um, yeah. Same wrist as the watch. Yeah. I mean, if there was more lateral movement, like if you assumed that he fell down a hill, that that he was actually tumbling, that's mm -hmm. much different than the actual mm -hmm. scene we're looking at where it's, you know, it's a straight up and down wall. If he fell, it's right. a direct fall. There's not a ton of opportunities for all that type of injury to happen to him. And you've got footage of him at the ATM. Obviously, he doesn't have the marks on his face at that point. Right. Um, Which is about an hour before he stops moving. Right. Close to it. Right. Did you ever see the Snapchat photos that were supposedly sent to his friend kind of pocket yes. dial? What, yes. What, I they... actually asked him to send them to me. Okay. What are they? Um, they're just, they're just pictures. They're random pictures. Um, there's a picture of, um, me and him. Okay. And there's a video that was sent and, I'm trying to think what the other one was, to be honest. But they're they're obviously not from. Oh, it was a, it was a phone number, like a random phone number, of like like okay. he had taken a screenshot of. So they were like something was going on, and his phone was randomly setting off these pictures and sending them pictures that so were previously I, taken. Though they were they were already stored. Right, on the phone. they were on his camera roll. So okay, you know maybe when he was Snapchatting the last actual. The last actual um, communication was sent to a friend of his that lives in Aurora, Illinois. Okay. And it's a female. And he says, I have no clue where I'm at. Like, I'm lost. Right. And uh, she was busy at the time and didn't respond. So I don't know if he just didn't take his phone off Snapchat mm. and put it in his pocket. Right. Or was walking and it was randomly clicked on someone else and sent only, you know, the, his, you know, his pictures off his camera roll. Right. It, that's what it sounds like. It's just random things we're sending. Okay. Um, now there's a couple of really strange things that we haven't touched on in this video yet. And that is, you found that the location data from his phone had two days worth of information deleted. Yeah, actually, I've, Everything from the time, from the time, um, so his location history on his Apple phone was on. Okay. So it should have picked up um, because he had, um, what do you call it, gigabytes or whatever, like he could use instead of just Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, so it should have picked up like his location histories. Like when I go into my location history, it tells me where I go all over the place. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Google, he didn't have that on, okay. which Google really tracks you. Yeah. Um, but he only had that when using. So, but it shows that he was never there. It, I think it shows the last thing it shows is like back when he was in California. 
Hmm. Like it doesn't, but it was on when we got the phone. Weird. So I've, I've called Apple. Unfortunately, Apple is very difficult to work with. Um, as far as they're very big into, um, um, protecting people's rights yeah. and, and privacy, which I understand, yep. but in things like this, I feel like it's important, but they tried to help me recover it and do some different things. And then we lost some information. Thank God I screenshotted everything that I did have yeah. um, prior, but um, it's just, you can't get it back. Okay. It's encrypted and you cannot get that information back. So to me, it almost feels like someone went in and deleted his locations at that point. And that's why his location history on his Verizon phone was so important to me because maybe it would only say where his phone was pinging from. Right. But it's going to give you something. Something's better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then you have this other twist with his Facebook account. And I haven't explained this to the audience yet. Can you explain what happens with his Facebook account? Well, um, I was able to get into his, the night he died, I was all over the place. You know, I was like, this isn't Tyler, he, you know, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going into his laptop. I'm going in. I was into his Facebook that night and I had no problem getting into it. I mean, he, it just, I was able to get into it. It was, you didn't have to do is click on it. Yeah. And, um, I didn't see anything that I can remember. I mean, I'm obviously in very much shock. Um, and I didn't see anything that looked like something was wrong that stuck out to me. Yeah. And then that Sunday night I noticed I couldn't get into it. And so I'm like, Oh, that's weird. You know, like I can't get into his Facebook. And so then I thought, Oh, maybe I changed the, you know, maybe the password's wrong or maybe I just can't focus right now. And then I noticed on Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, or was it Sunday? I think it was actually that Sunday. That's what it was. That, that Sunday then, that night, Yeah. I said, hey, who turned Tyler's Facebook page to a remembrance page? And I asked all his friends. I asked his girlfriend. I asked everybody. I'm like, it's okay if you did it. I'm, I'm, I would be upset if you did it because that's important information to me, but right. at least tell me so I don't have to worry about it, you know? And so we, for, gosh, I would say a good six, eight months went by. And I, you know, of course I asked again, if we could have, find out who shut Tyler's Facebook down, but Facebook is another one that will not release that information. Yeah. And so then um, a friend of his, who's a police officer in St. Louis reached out to me about eight months later and said, Oh, well, I called them and shut it down on Wednesday Okay. and asked them to, and it took them two days. And I noticed when I came to his visitation on Friday, the day before his funeral, that it was put as a memorial um, okay. page. And I just said, when did you do it? And he said, Wednesday. And I said, well, it was before Wednesday that this, because I'm, I'm reaching out to friends and stuff going, okay, what day was it that I noticed that? And they're like, it was Sunday night. Right, right. So right. maybe he reached out and someone else did too. I don't know. Yeah, I looked into it a little bit because I was trying to understand that. And from what I had always heard, it was almost kind of difficult to get those pages set for memorial pages. You had to send in yeah. like a death certificate or something yeah. significant. And the time frame I heard on the other podcast you had done uh, made it sound like it happened almost within like 24 or 48 yeah. hours. Yeah. Um, so obviously that type of paperwork isn't really available that quickly. But I did exactly. see there's some other features where you can set like a legacy mm -hmm. person, like someone mm -hmm. that is responsible for your account if you pass away and they're able to flip that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but it makes sense that, yeah, someone in law enforcement would be able to kind of make a phone call and get something like that to go. So it's weird because mm -hmm. it almost feels like you have an answer, but not really with the time frame that you're looking yeah. at. So it might've been more than one person. Hmm. Yeah. And what's the the real the downside of that is 
do some posts disappear or like his messenger stuff disappears or yeah messenger is gone okay messenger is gone um you you can still make posts on his facebook but you can't get you can't tag him into anything or see what he was tagged into um it's just a memorial page where you can write on and you know it's it's yeah. not a full access so that is as an investigative tool i mean it's just it damages yeah. things a little bit okay oh for sure okay and i asked i asked the person i said why would you do that without even consulting with us you know and he just said you know, as a police officer, um, I had a friend commit suicide and nobody shut off their page and all this stuff. And people were doing all these horrible things to his page and mm -hmm. and um, using him to, you know, there's a lot of, you know, fake pages out there where they try to use other people's profiles and things. And he just said, I didn't want that to happen to him. Right. Right. So it came from a good place. Yeah. Um, all right. So introduce, um, we, we get Mitch Drake that starts helping on this. And, mm -hmm. uh, I really like that he released a whole official press release with his observations mm -hmm. and information and went through the whole thing. One of the things that stuck out to me that I haven't heard talked about anywhere else before is that a tip had been called in, um, about two people that supposedly were bragging about beating up Tyler. Mm -hmm. And when they tried to chase down those leads, was it law enforcement that actually tried to process those leads or was it Mitch? Yeah, that was actually the last time they even worked on Tyler's case. And that was, I think, March of 2019. Okay. That the original um, police officers on Tyler's case worked on his case. They, they did follow up. It was um, a lead that was called in um, and from my understanding is they, they did go in and they, they questioned the two people. Right. And, um, it sounds like one maybe didn't have like an alibi and mm -hmm. that said he was working. So they asked for like a paycheck stub or something like that. And he just said, I didn't do it, you know, and the other one said that he knew Tyler, which, Tyler had never been to Galesburg before. So I thought that was kind of odd. Yeah. Um, but they just kind of was like, okay, then they just let it go. Is that something, is Mitch still working this case? No, the state police actually have been working this case okay. since just before Tyler got exhumed last year. Right. Right. Okay. And is that a lead that they're still potentially looking into or has that thing just, kind of, it's weird. I think, they looked in, I think they looked into that lead, but it okay. just, I don't know if it was time lapse or what, but okay. it just didn't. Um, the person that actually called in that lead, mm -hmm. um, come to find out, it's actually the aunt of the person that Tyler um, was supposed to stay with. <laughs> oh, and I guess that she is. Um, from what I hear, she's a drug user. Okay, um, methamphetamines and things like that are very high in Galesburg. They have a huge problem. Okay. And it sounds like to me, um, she has now withdrawn her um, tip that she called in gotcha. and said, oh, I was just high or whatever. Okay. Like, I was, I wasn't telling the truth. Um, okay. You, you also mentioned in the footage from the store that um, you saw a truck also. Mm -hmm. Was that ever investigated as a lead? Did they ever try to track down the truck? No. Okay. And I know the footage. I did, I did provide them who it was. Um, I was able to figure out um, who it was. I have his plates. I have, um, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're a mother on a mission, you, you keep your enemies close, you know, not that some people are enemies, but you get to learn the community in that area and you have people watch out for you and come to find out he's a regular that goes in there all the time and he's a drinker and he's a drunk. And, um, you know, I was able to get his plates. I was able to get, you know, the truck has damage to it, you know, didn't know if that was new damage, old damage. I don't know, but nobody checked into it. Yeah. That's one of the things that's another um, kind of theory that's kicking around in my head too, like a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Tyler crossing the street, someone mm -hmm. hits him, knows that it's bad and then tries to move him 
to mm-hmm. to hide it in some way because mm-hmm. um, it really comes down to for me when you're looking at that scene where tyler's found it, it had to have either been a fall or not not his own fall you know someone right. pushing or flipping him from the top which mm-hmm. i know you had the accident uh, reconstruction specialist look at it and that was kind of their conclusion that uh it was somehow he had flipped almost like feet overhead over the edge of the rail and then landed in that position um, mm-hmm. or a staging effort that this all mm-hmm. happened somewhere else and someone dragged him to, to that mm-hmm. position. Um, I, I really can't imagine anything outside of those conditions. So thinking of that car accident scenario would kind of make mm-hmm. sense. And I know, you know, Mitch mm-hmm. makes a great point that, Hey, that's a horrible place to, to dump a body. I mean, you know, look how quickly he's discovered. I don't feel like it was something that was planned necessarily to that point where it was, mm-hmm. you know, I think it was just, no, I truly feel like something happened and it was okay. We got to get rid of this, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like, I don't think it was a, you know, we planned on killing Tyler Smith this day. It was something happened and like, Oh my gosh, we got to cover our butts, yeah. you know, and get rid of this quickly. Yeah, it's all too randomized. It's it's mm-hmm. just, you know, mm-hmm. he's not from the area. He's in that area mm-hmm. for a matter of a day. And yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, what do you think about the accident reconstruction? It's, it's theory. Do you think that it is likely that he f- went over the edge of that rail? My theory is there's two things that could have happened. If he did go over that rail, he was already deceased or unconscious. Yeah. Or there is a ramp that goes down to there is the way they took Tyler's bodies out. Right. And everybody says that that's probably least likely because it would cause more attention. But I have been down to where Tyler passed away and nobody pays attention to you down there. I've been down there and seen a meth head down in there. And... um about to call the police and the train that goes by um, called it in and saw him down in there. Wow. You know, so um, nobody pays attention to what's down there. It's a high crime drug. There's a meth house down, no meth house down the street. Um, Like people call it crystal palace. Um, Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of just to me, when they find when they find Tyler and they're trying to get the lock unlocked on this gate that ramps down into there, mm-hmm. which is about probably I would guess a hundred yards away, yeah, east of where Tyler's body is found, mm-hmm. um, they can't get it unlocked. And you can see them with a key, like they have the key to do it. I have mm-hmm. it on dash cam, and that I pointed. And um, they finally the fire come with bolt cutters and cut that lock. Right. And then I asked the coroner, when you move Tyler, did you put him on a gurney and take him to your vehicle? Or and he said, no, I was able to drive all the way down to where he was at and put him right into the vehicle. And his, the coroner's vehicle is pretty large. I mean, it's a big, huge SUV. So to me, it's a possibility anybody could go down there and dump, you know, right. Um, right. cut a lock, put a new lock on. And, and I think they think, oh, that's just ridiculous. Um, that would take too much time. Um, people would notice, but if it's, you know, two in the morning or one in the morning and it's a high, and nobody pays attention to what happens down there. They really don't. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention you've got, um, some interesting cover in terms of the sound of the railway right there and some some other things. So, and it's an industrial area, which I think just at that time of night, you're not going to have at least not a, um, you, you might have some dark elements that are out in that particular area, exactly. but exactly, um, yeah, all the businesses are shut down for the day by the, long, long by then. Oh, for sure. Um, hmm. Okay. I know that there's been a second autopsy and I'm just, I'm so sorry that you guys had to face that. I mean, the thought of the mm-hmm. exhumation process, uh, the reburial process. I mean, but I, I know that you guys are doing it for the best of, of reasons. Mm-hmm. And, and I know you can't really go into specific details of the new autopsy information, but I did see some news articles and they left me with an impression. I just wanted to check with you guys. Mm-hmm. The first autopsy seemed to be 
manner of death, accidental, cause of death, drowning. And it was actually undetermined cause they, of death, drowning. Oh, so they well, had it. No, well, it was, it was, how did they put it? They put it was undetermined. Um, it was a cause of death was drowning with undetermined cause. Okay. Or something or like undetermined that. Undetermined manner. Okay. Okay. Undetermined manner. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because in a lot of the quotes and a lot of the information, it makes it sound like they had officially categorized it as an accident. And it they sounds, treated it like an accident. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So I, I assume at this point, because I saw something that made it sound like the cause of death was certainly now undetermined. And I wasn't sure if that was information from the second autopsy or referring back to the first. But. Um, there is a second, there is a cause of death and it's it's not drowning. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so what are the next steps from here? How, how are you guys processing this? Um, is there any information that could be helpful to ask from the public or how do we, how do we move forward? I, I, I don't know. Um, we're still waiting. We're still waiting to sit down with the, the state. They have been investigating every lead that has come in. Um, they've spent, they were there for the second autopsy. Um, they have, they still have a few more things to follow up with, but unfortunately at this point in time that we're aware of, um, we have not been told that there's anything promising as far as a suspect or, um, any final answers to what possibly could happen to Tyler. Um, we just don't know yet. We haven't sat down. They really want to sit down with us and go over everything they've done. Yeah. Um, and then make a decision from there. Um, it could just stay a cold case. I mean, it could be something that it might take years for someone to come forward and say, Hey, you know, this is what happened or, you know, um, I don't know. I, I just feel like it will probably become, I, you know, I really can't say, I really don't know. I don't know how it's going to end. I don't yeah. know if it will end. But mm, for me, as Tyler's mother, I made him a promise. And I will keep fighting. And I will keep pushing. And I will keep getting the word out there through the media if I have to. Um, at some point, I might even release um, the cause of death. Yeah. Um, Right now, they said, you know, they they don't want us to because they feel like it would maybe possibly um, hinder their investigation. Right. But when there is no investigation anymore, I don't feel like it's probably hindering anything. Yeah. So, um, but we spoke and we told them that we would not until we sat down with them and, and talked about different things. Mm -hmm. um, something still could come through at this point until that happens. So when is the sit down supposed to happen? I was told three, couple weeks, two to three weeks. Okay. Okay. Um, I know that you've been doing a lot on all fronts. And one of the other things I noticed in the photos on the Facebook page are the wonderful community events that you're doing around this. How are you guys honoring Tyler's memory? Um, well, after Tyler died, um, what pretty much made it clear was Tyler and I, his birthday, we're very, Tyler and I had a very close bond and his birthday was the 12th. Mine was the 13th. And so we always did something for our birthdays. And I thought, how can I give back and, and keep his honor and his memory alive in a positive, you know, in a positive way that he would want it. Right. And with Tyler, you know, wanting to work in public service as a police officer, he was hired as a police officer with San Jose police. Um, he was military. He was, he was all about public service and, and wanting to help. And so I thought, okay, we've got to give back. We've got to, we've got to do something. So I, I started with a shirt sale and just did to honor Tyler and um, all proceeds went into the bank account and I was able to, we started a 5k the first one was on the anniversary of his first year of death. Wow. It fell on the 15th. I always try to have him on a Sunday. And so anytime, any Sunday around the time of his death and his birthday. Um, the second one fell on my birthday last year. 
Mm. And this year we have a 5K and it is falling on Tyler's birthday this year. And all proceeds um, go to his, that we, we raise, goes to a foundation we had set up through the Rochelle Community Foundation. And that's what we would do with all the money is we put it in there. And um, once it's big enough, it will give out grants. And our, in the meantime, while that's growing, our family has provided um, scholarships. We just, on Monday night, gave away two $500 scholarships to two high school students here in his hometown that he went to school with. Wow. And then we always donate to a nonprofit that we feel would be close to Tyler's heart. So um, the first year we were building, so I just did the scholarships. The second year I donated to actually the missing persons of Illinois, mm. because I know what it's like to have to get that phone call and, and, and be in a panic knowing that something's not right. And your son is, or your child is missing. Yeah. And those resources are needed out there. You know, thank God for people that are willing to do that. Yeah. And, um, this year we gave to the San Jose police department where Tyler was going to work and it went to a fund that, um, provides kids in, um, not such great areas of San Jose, high crime gang, areas um and they take a classroom full of kids and they take them camping for one night and they get them out of the hood and they get them out of the hustle and the bustle of the streets and show them that hey you know what you you, there's there's more out there in the world you're not stuck here you know and that's who tyler was he was he 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 chose san jose because the diversity there and he was going to be serving a million people and he wanted to make change and he wanted to make a difference in someone's life, whether it just be one person or a hundred people. And I feel like we can still do that in his honor by doing this, you know, yeah. and, and letting know, and people know that, you know, his life mattered. Yep. Absolutely. The um, missing persons, Illinois group, is that the group run by Gia? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, on behalf of myself and my amazing supporters, we're going to be making a donation in Tyler's honor to that organization on Thank today's you. episode as well. Yeah. Thank so you. You got it. And uh, if you do happen to bump into Gia, let her know that she's got a big fan out here on YouTube that's been watching her work. Awesome. I really appreciate her. Tyler's tragedy is happening right now to some another family. There's so many out there that have been neglected. There's so many people out there that have been blown off. There's so many people that need help and there's so many families that have just given up yeah, and, or just took that gut feeling and just threw it away when they knew something wasn't right because they just couldn't do it. Well, that's a big part of the reason why I wanted to spend this time with you guys here today and share your story in particular, because I really think you're a shining example of keeping that fight going, putting a great Mm -hmm. team together, staying focused. I, you know, I keep reading about Tyler and his laser focus for his goals. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I, I see where he got that from because uh, <laughs> I know, I know this, uh, I know you're going to stay on this. So, oh yeah, I, I'm still going to be looking and I'm still going to be pushing and I'm still going to be, I'm not just going to go away. Yeah. You know, I've, I've put, it's almost been three years. So I just released a, a dash cam video on Tyler's justice for Tyler page just a week ago. Yeah. Just to prove how fast, and I haven't shared a lot of stuff. And people are like, oh, she just found this. No, I've had this, you know, but I'm, I'm trying to keep it factual. But the fact is, is that they, in less than an hour and a half, they claimed Tyler was an accident with no, no investigation. Right. And if, if any family is pro-police, it's ours. Our son, that was his dream. Right. But we also believe that police are there to protect and serve. You know, and um, we didn't feel that that was done at all for our son. Right. Uh, For anyone that is watching, uh, I'll have a link to the Facebook page in the description box below. Is there any other places we should follow or is that the main place for updates on the case and events? That's the main. Yeah. Um, Justice for Tyler Smith Facebook page is the the main page. Um, We have the... um, the memorial fund as well that 
you know, if people want to donate. Um, we have a page that's, um, we have a $25,000 reward yep. out for information that will lead to arrest and conviction. Right. And um, we have not taken any money from that. Okay. Um, it's a pledge so that if that did come up, people that have pledged will then pay and okay. help us pay that. Okay. So, and that's a separate page, right? That's its own. That is a separate page. But it's called, you know, pledges for Tyler Smith. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have a link so, to that down below. As yeah. Well. And then we have a, we have a page, we have several pages. We have a, a 5k page. Oh, okay. So if anybody loves to run 5k, you know, or you can do a virtual, even if you want, you can walk it, you can yeah. do half of it. Yeah. Um, it's actually, a, it's a, a very nice time to celebrate his life with his friends and his family. And, nice. you know, I can't, I can't do anything for my son anymore. You know, there's no birthdays. So this is the one thing I can do. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I'm, I'm sure he's, he's looking down and very happy seeing that the photos of the 5k event in particular, um, a lot of smiles, a lot of people yeah. making big personal goals and stuff. It's a great, great thing. So, and the community here where we live has been so supportive. Yeah. Well, your uh, team Tyler is about to grow, and uh, I'm the first yeah. one to jump in line with the rest of you. you. And I do run 5Ks occasionally, so uh, don't be surprised. Uh, you might see me pop up. Oh, in one of those I'd out love there. to meet you in person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much uh, for your time you. and for sharing your stories with us. We really appreciate you guys, and uh, we're 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 here with you, waiting for justice. We're going to be you. with you thank every you step so of the way. Thank you so much. Oh, Keith wants to share something with yeah, you as well. Please do. Uh, he was in first grade, and it's he made a book that everybody did in first grade, and it says someday. Oh, and, is this the book um, that the pages? This is the book. Yeah. This is the book. And, you know, um, you know, it, it, the, the two main ones that stick out is it, it, someday I'm going to be, I'm going to be an army man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the very and, next and then the very next page, it says someday I will be a police officer and touch the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know. No. But, um, but, the very, the but on the very back. But for now, it's just time for first grade. <laughs> oh my God. So, that, that is so sweet. That is awesome. And and you know, it's a very it's a big treasure. And sometimes, you know, I think about Mitch and Gia mm -hmm. and all the people that have come into our lives. And I really consider that divine intervention. Yeah. You know, Tyler's still looking out for us as his parents. And, you know, I pray every day. I pray <laughs> 24 hours a day, but we'll just get some, some answers and it's not going to bring them back. Yeah. I'm not in denial. My son's gone. It's just, I feel like he's still doing his work just through me and other people. Absolutely. Looking to catch Absolutely. the bad guy. Yeah. Waiting to catch the guy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sandy. Sure. Sure. Thank you so much. You got it. I got to tell you guys, uh, this case has grabbed me on so many different emotional levels. But after the interview, Sandy and Keith gave me a special tour of a room that they've put together commemorating Tyler's life. And I got to tell you, um, so much love and life in that room. I was just really, really moved by it. Uh, before I end today's episode, of course, I've got... Some other links for you in the description box down below. I want to let you guys know about uh, starting with missinginillinois.org. Gia Wright has a write-up particularly on this case. I'm going to have that down there. But remember, they also take donations. Once again, thank you to our supporters. We're making a donation to Missing in Illinois just as soon as I'm done filming today. Also in the description box down below, you'll find the link for Justice for Ty at Facebook. And this is the one you want to follow. If you want to keep up to date on the latest events, what's going on with the case, follow this Facebook group. If you want to help pledge support for the $25,000 reward, you can do that at this other link, Pledges for Tyler Smith Information Reward. I'll have a link to that in the description box down below as well. 
Also down there, the statement press release from Mitchell Drake, the certified homicide investigator that looked into this case with his conclusions. A lot of details we didn't quite necessarily get to with this video, but a deeper dive is ready for you if you go into all the sources I have down below for you. And also down there, a video with the police reacting to the handling of the Tyler Smith death investigation. Some quotes from them if you want to see GPD's side on all of that as well. Thank you guys so much for the support. I can't do this without you. A uh, big thank you to new patrons C.A. Bonema, uh, Peyton Stidham, and Marie. On top of that, a big thank you to Catherine Zion for increasing her pledge and Malie K. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Wendy Trevette recently did. We really appreciate your support as we try to help these families in these terrible, terrible situations. And remember, we're still looking for information on this case. If you have friends, family, social media contacts, anyone that you know in the Illinois area, please share this video with them. Let's let them know about Tyler's amazing family, Tyler's life, the tragedy that they're facing, and maybe someone out there has the information that can help. If you're that person, all the contact details that you need are in the description box below, and maybe you'll get a big reward out of it too. But I can tell you the feeling that you'll get inside for passing along that information, probably bigger than the 25K. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you again here on Monday on the Lord and Arch Channel.